Welcome to a new episode of How It Works with Holger. Today I would like to show you how to show validation errors in forms that you created with TMS Web Core and Bootstrap. Hopefully you'll be just as surprised as I was how easy it is because it literally comes down to adding a class to an edit field and Bootstrap does the whole work for you. Looking at this example of a login form, here I can enter my login and I could enter a password. Obviously I typed it fast and didn't even look what I was typing, so this should be wrong. I click login and immediately I get informed that my password and my login are incorrect by these red lines. If I instead enter the correct password and click login, I get my request for the one-time password in this particular example. So no longer the form is showing any validation errors because I know that this login is correct. Of course, the login operation is not completed because I also need to provide a one-time password, which I won't go into in this short little video. However, how do you build this in your TMS Web Core application? As said, this form is completely built with Bootstrap. Still, we have the visual controls on our form inside of the Delphi form designer. Here is the edit control for the login, the edit control for the password, and even the edit control for the pop-up that comes up when the login is okay, but I ask for the additional code. So if you've seen one of my other bootstrap videos with TMS Web Core, you know that you can bind controls inside of the form designer using the element ID property and then select the associated HTML control that you have in your page design. And that is the key how this works. The key is that I'm using the HTML of this form to specify my form layout, meaning this is my form layout right here. This is the specification of the positions using a grid model in Bootstrap. Just like you as a long time Delphi developer, I struggle getting my head into these new concepts of building a form and then having HTML at the same time. It surely takes some time to getting used to it. So let me explain to you what is going on on this form. First of all, how do I get this information that I know how to build this? You can always go to getbootstrap.com, select the version that TMS Web Core supports right now that is 502, and then you get, after reading the introduction, the most important thing here on the left side, how to build a layout. And the three most important things here are containers, how to build the grid, don't confuse them with the grids that we actually see. This is the grid system I'm going to show you in a second and how to build columns. Again, this refers to columns inside of the grid structure. What we'll use here is from the form sections, how to build forms. And if we look at the overview here, this is all we need. We don't need to go into any of the details here. I literally copied this instead of email address. I placed the login and the password I could even copy paste. So this is what I started off with because I am not a web designer either. So if I would want more sophisticated design, of course, I would ask a web designer to have a look at it. The key thing here on this login view is on the right, I log my messages. If the user has been logged in or if there has been a mistake, for example, I log in and then I provide a one-time password, which is definitely not correct. And then I get invalid user credentials here on the right side. So this is a text area that is in TMS Web Core, a memo control. And that is the first thing you have to learn how to map certain HTML elements to TMS Web Core controls if you want to use them. And the input controls are T Web Edit controls and the text area is a T-Web memo control. TMS makes it quite easy to 
get these things synced up. I don't want to go into detail now because I've done a separate video which explains the syncing and also the binding. So if you just want a quick view on how the binding works, you can right click in the designer, click control binding. And there I see that my controls here, the login button, the other button, and here the edit controls are linked to these HTML elements. And the HTML elements all have IDs. And this is how we can link to all the different HTML tags using the ID. However, in addition to just setting the controls, the edit controls and the buttons, the positioning is also a key factor here. Let's move the size of this form. You can see that it is responsive. And not even is it responsive, it even has a mobile view. If I go smaller than this here, this is how it would look on your iPhone, on your Android phone. This is where it happens that columns that are next to each other are actually being stacked. And this is all done without writing a single line of code. This is all inside of the bootstrap grid. We built this using a container and inside of the container I have a row. And in this row, I have two columns. And if you're like having issues reading it like this, here's a hint. You can press F12 and look at the form right here. Let's make it a little bit bigger. So we have the side by side view and I click here on this icon here. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's like a button. Um, and then the mouse cursor is there. And here you see when I move, hover, not clicking, if I just hover on all the different elements, it shows me all the tags that cause this. So if I move to the outside, <clears throat> I see the green thing here is the outer container or the row. If you click on it, you actually get the location inside of your HTML. So you see that it is the container. And here we have one column. And here we have another column and this, this whole thing inside of a container is what we refer to as a grid. So I have a um, container and this container hosts a row and this row has two columns. And this is exactly what I pointed you to in the documentation where you get explanations. Why does Holger use six here, for example, because each bootstrap grid has exactly 12 columns. So if I said, the left one to six and the right one to six. That means the two columns share or each column takes 50%. They share the space. For example, if I wanted to make the login a little bit bigger, I could do eight plus four is 12 again. If I save it now and run it again, you will notice that the um, width of the first column changed. There you go. See, this is now significantly wider. However, as soon as we make it smaller, the stacking will still be this happen the same way. However, this is significantly smaller than it was before. You also have classes MD, SM for small, medium, LG for large. These are breakpoints when the stacking occurs. Anything smaller than the device size that you specify, for example, MD means that if you have one of the newer iPhones with a bigger screen, it's also stacking already. Otherwise, only the older iPhones would stack the dialogue and the newer iPhones would still, even if in portrait, would try to show the dialogue next to each other, which is not what I want. So that's why I used MD in this case. And this is how you can, by cascading the different divs, you can build your forms. And the form has nothing more than two edit controls. This is the one. You add a label and the input. The label refers for, using the for attribute to this input control. And the same with password. We have a label and we have an input. Notice that label is something when I learned HTML label didn't exist. So this is something that has been introduced for forms. Also note that we're not going to use a form tag. Back in the day, you always had to start with form, but we're not going to use any of that functionality. We're not going to 
send the data somewhere using a post request when they click on a submit button. We're also not gonna have a submit or a reset button. Those are not even on the form. The only thing we built is a form in the sense if we think of a Delphi form to enter information. And finally here we have the button, some bootstrap magic to make it flush to the right by saying justify content at the end. And the button is green by using the button success class in addition to the button class. Again, I have a long, long video. It's not in the how it works series. It's like hands-on um, TMS WebCoin bootstrap. It's available for free on the TMS channel that goes into great detail to explain these things. So this is all the first column nicely seen here with the indentation and the second column is just the um, memo control the text area txt log and that's it and now the thing that you need to find in the documentation which i've missed for months and months and months is how can you make this appear as if it were invalid and it is actually much easier than you think you can add to the class of the element that you want to invalidate. For example, let's say I want to invalidate the password. All I need to do is set an additional class is invalid. That's what we need to set because our, of course our program automatically switches to that. So let me show that at runtime. So I select the password right here. Let's click on it. And this is a live view, so you can make changes to this. So you can really change things at runtime. So I double click here on this form control and I add is invalid. So this is overriding any program that is running right now. So with this, I change the HTML as it is in the browser. And you see now that the edit control is drawn as invalid input. And this is all we need to do. We need to write a program, so to speak, a method that adds is invalid to the class if our content is invalid. So let's look how we can make this change using source code. And TMS Web Core makes this really, really easy because we have access to all these different elements on our web page using objects. Yes real object so our source code when we compile it is type safe even with operations like that big advantage to other web frameworks because there we hardly ever have type safety and in this case we have it so how did i structure this i created a class called tbootstrap utils that is part of my project and it also shows the modal form that's for another day but here the invalidate form control and it has two parameters first the element or the element id the only difference is one time i pass a string the string would be in this case txt password for example or the actual element tjs html element that means that is the reference that i get using this element id that's that's the only comfort that's why it's an overload and the Second parameter is if it is valid or not. And by default, I say, no, it is not valid. So I would show the is invalid or at the is invalid string to the class list. So going from here, I have a nice resource string. So I don't have to retype it, you know, brings down, it increases the maintainability if at some point Bootstrap decides to name it differently and then going from there. So yeah, if we just have the string, I need to go to the document and say get HTML element by ID and then I can get the JS HTML element and call the other overload, which already expects me to use the JS HTML element. And there I look if it is valid, meaning I have to remove the string and the element has a nice little property called class list in which every single class 
that is listed because nowadays, not only nowadays, usually in HTML, you have not only one, but quite a few classes. So in this case, class list would be D, D grid and B3 justified content. And that will all be three elements in the class list. With regards to our um, is invalid, that means that we can simply remove it when the content is valid because then it doesn't have to be there. So we can call a element class list remove and string. There's no exception if this thing isn't there, if it's used for initialization, for example. And here we add it to the class list. And there's nothing to do like a refresh or whatever. TMS Web Core does that for us immediately the visual changes will be seen. And how do I call this? Well, very easy. I have a method right here called show form status. And again, I asked, is it valid or not? And then here in this case, I get the element handle of my controls. So each of these controls here, this one and this one, they have a non-published, I should say, non-visual in the object inspector. And the reason is the property isn't published. So I can access the element handle and that is of type TJS HTML element. Exactly what I need for my other method there. And then I can pass it in T bootstrap utils invalidate form control once for the login with the value for valid and again for the password for valid. And you might wonder who calls this show form status? Well, without going into all the multi-tier architecture of the application. Of course, there is a web service that is being called in order to find out is the login valid or not. And the key is to go into the client load of the um, TX data web client. And this looks at the status code and then gets a reply from the web service. Is the user authorized or not? And that boils down to the fact Hey, is it valid or not? I call it this variable can, meaning is can the user continue to log in, meaning that the first step is complete. And that's why I call this Boolean variable L can. So show form status is being called with true when the login was successful or false when the login wasn't successful. And that means the is invalid flags are being flipped. Accordingly, that's all there is. And of course, if it is set to false before, this, this overrides it. So the status is always going to be updated as soon as the user clicks on the login button, so to speak. And that's exactly what we want. So visually, there is not much for us to do. It's simply adding a single class to the list of all available classes. That's all the magic there is. And it makes a whole lot of difference if you can supply your users with a great user experience where invalid entries immediately point to the location where something might be wrong. We're already at the end of this video. If you like this concept, there is also a live version of how it works with Hogger. You will have the ability to ask questions and there's already been two episodes that occurred live. In the first one, we talked about SQLite and FireDAC. The second time we looked at IO utils and TDateTime. And don't miss the announcement for the next episode. Go to the channel. You see youtube.com slash engineering is the URL. And you'll see upcoming events where you have the ability to participate, ask your questions live. If you like this topic, please give us a thumbs up and stay tuned for more How It Works with Holger.